Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Nossel. I am the director of the School of Policy Studies, and I wanted to begin today by acknowledging that we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. I would like to ask Betty Carbriant, the elder in residence at the Four Directions Aboriginal Student Centre, and Janice Hill, the director, to welcome us today. Sego se wagwego, skanagoa se wagwego, wat kwanu horadu. Ganu shuni yungyats, wagenyatu, ni wagitaro tu, nuk kundege tegitaro. Greetings and peace to all of you. Welcome. My name is Janice Hill. I'm a member of the Turtle Clan of the Mohawk Nation, and I come from Tayendinaga Mohawk Territory. I'm also the director of the Four Directions Aboriginal Student Center here at Queen's University. Sego Joan Johatstone Yungyax Watka Tahuni Dano Gayangahaga Tindaneka Tigiron. My name, my spirit name means she moves through the earth or passes through the earth, and it's an honor to be here today. Gunjoko Gunjoka Sawada Husio Skani Gariwasa De Chidawanu Horado Ne Sungwa at Diso. Newahi Rosa Anyo, Negadi, Neohandu Gari Wadekwa, Unko Wana Hetstu, Ona Sewadahun Sios, Gunjoka, Ne Egadi, Ohandu Gari Wadekwa, Ungade, Wanungode. Please lend me your ears for a few minutes as we gather our minds together to offer the words that come before all others and offer our greetings and thanks to the Creator and all things in the natural world, as we have been taught to do and is the custom of our people, the Haudenosaunee. This is what we have been instructed to do before any business shall come to pass where two or more people are gathered. This opening can be done in as small as three or four minutes, but a gifted speaker at ceremony might take four hours. <laughs> <laughs> We're not gonna do the four hour version. <laughs> Aguego unska and Didoat wait nuni, ne unguat nigora, dano de atinorado, ne aguego yunki yenawase, geo and jade. We offer our greetings and our thanksgiving to everything that has been placed on earth for us to live a good life. We're really grateful for all of the things, um, uh, all of the things on the earth, all the green and growing things, the medicines, the foods, the plants, the trees the shrubs and the grasses, the waters, and life within the waters, and to our relatives, the animals. Aguego unska, and didawat wait nuni, ne unguat nigura, dano dea tinuarado, ne aguego yunki yenawase, ji, tgarun hyade. We offer our greetings, our thanks to all the things in the sky and the heavens. We gather our minds together, and we offer our greetings and our thanks to the winds that come from the four directions, our elder brother, the sun, our grandmother, the moon, our grandfathers, the thunder beings, the stars in the heavens. And finally, we offer our choices, words of greetings and thanksgiving to Sungwai Dison, the creator of all things. He created everything we need to live a good life, and we're really grateful for that. And so now the words that come before our others have been said and we can focus on the reason we are gathered here. If any of you are carrying burdens, I invite you to leave them at the door for the time we have gathered. You may choose to pick them up on your way out, but I suggest leaving them for the Creator to take care of them. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I won't go on. <laughs> much, Betty and Janice. I'd like to welcome everyone today to the inaugural lecture of the Tom Corshane Distinguished Se Speaker Series. The Queen's School of Policy Studies wanted to recognize the enduring legacy of the first director of the school. Tom Corshane came to Queen's in 1987 as the Stouffer Dunning Chair 
in public policy and the first director of what was then the new School of Policy Studies. From 1992 until his retirement in 2012, Tom held the Jaroslawski Deutsch Professorship in Economics and Financial Policy and as a member of the Department of Economics, even though he remained a key member of the School of Policy Studies for all of that time. For his leadership of the school and for his long and distinguished academic record, Tom has been widely recognized, most notably by election as a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada as, and as an Officer of the Order of Canada. As the inaugural director of the Queen's School of Policy Studies, Tom sought to bring together the academic and professional communities through the school's programs, conferences, and lectures. And we hope to continue that legacy through the Tom Crochane Distinguished Speaker Series, which will support ongoing discussion on critical issues in public policy, and in particular, in indigenous policy and governance, a field that Tom has been increasingly engaged in in recent years, and indeed is writing a book about now. The new speaker series is supported by the Margie and Tom Corshane Endowment Fund. This fund was established in 1999 with an initial gift by the Corshanes, and since that time, many generous donations from Dr. Corshane's colleagues at Queen's and indeed across the country have supplemented the fund. This endowment will allow the school to provide our students and the Queen's community more generally to provide that crucial bridge between academics and policymakers. Given Tom's desire to have the Endowment Fund support speakers in Indigenous policy and governance, it's fitting that the first speaker in the Tom Corshane Distinguished Speaker Series should be a distinguished member of the bench, a distinguished Ojibwe, Manitoban, and Canadian, the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair. And indeed, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome Justice Sinclair to Kingston, to Queens, to the School of Policy Studies, and indeed to this wonderful new venue on the Queens campus, the Isabel Beda Center for the Performing Arts. Justice Murray Sinclair was born north of Selkirk, Manitoba, graduated from the U of M, University of Manitoba's Law School in 1979, called to the bar in 1980, and appointed as Manitoba's first Aboriginal judge. In 1988, appointed Associate Chief Justice of the Provincial Court of Manitoba, and then in 2001 to the Court of Queen's Bench of Manitoba. Justice Sinclair distinguished himself on the bench for his work on commissions of inquiry, among other things. In 1988, he was appointed co-commissioner of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry on the justice system in Manitoba, and the report of that commission produced major changes that are still felt today in that province. Justice Sinclair was appointed to head the Pediatric Cardiac Surgery Inquest, an inquiry into 12 deaths at the Winnipeg Health Sciences Center uh, that occurred in 1994. His report, released in 2000, was widely hailed for its thoroughness and its careful examination of this complex and tragic case. It was no doubt because of his reputation for thoughtful and comprehensive investigation and his standing as a First Nations leader that Justice Sinclair was asked in 2008 to chair the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada part of a comprehensive response to the Indian residential school legacy. The Commission's mandate is to inform all Canadians about what happened in Indian residential schools and to document the experiences of survivors, their families, their communities, and indeed anyone who was personally affected by the Ind Indian residential schools experience. The Commission is intended to document the truth and to honor their experiences. The Commission has always emphasized healing. It held several national events across the country, visited over 500 communities, heard testimony from over 6,000 people, and indeed it continues its ongoing activities to reconcile the two solitudes, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians, to create 
renewed relationships based on mutual understanding and respect. Indeed, it is fitting that we're meeting today on the first anniversary of the Commission's final national public hearings, which took place in Edmonton from the 27th to the 30th of March 2014. Justice Sinclair's tireless work on behalf of reconciling Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians, his consistent advocacy for Aboriginal justice, these have been widely recognized and lauded. He's received a National Aboriginal Achievement Award, a number of other community service awards, and eight honorary degrees. So I would ask you all to join me in welcoming Justice Sinclair as I ask him to give the inaugural Tom Cushane Distinguished Lecture, What Do We Do About the Legacy of Indian Residential Schools? Justice Sinclair. Uh, good afternoon. Miigwech for that greeting and for that welcome. Miigwech to the, um, the elders and the drummers who have uh, brought us here in a good way. And uh, I thank you for that. Uh, I want to begin by saying I really like your teepee. <laughs> I have spoken in many places in this country, uh, some of them very small, uh, none quite as large as this, I think, but uh, this is a beautiful space, and so you're very lucky to be able to have it at your disposal, to be able to use it. I do want to acknowledge that though you built it on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe, and uh, I thank them for the welcome and for the greeting that they've extended to me on my arrival. I do want to uh, acknowledge that we're a little behind schedule here, uh, we've had some challenges, technologically speaking, but I think we've got them all ironed out. Uh, so I want to uh, get into it, because I know that uh, many of you are students who are in this uh, gathering here, and uh, student schedules are not always things that you can control. Some of you, I think, probably will have to leave uh, sometime during this event in order to go to class or to go have coffee with somebody really important in your life. <coughs> Uh, and I acknowledge that. I want you to know uh, all of my kids have been to a uh, university, and, and I remember my university days too. So uh, I acknowledge that uh, we're, because we're behind time, we need to get into what it is we're going to talk about. I'm here to, uh, to talk to you about residential schools um, because I think uh, our first obligation as a commission is to educate the public about residential schools and is useful a way as possible so that we can really have a dialogue around reconciliation. Um, the, uh, the Master of Ceremonies, Kim, m mentioned that a year ago was our last national event. We were mandated as a commission to hold seven national events uh, across the country, and, uh, and our last one was in Edmonton, Alberta, a year ago. And at that time, in my closing remarks to the event, in a room filled with thousands of people webcast around the world to 62 different countries and watched on local cable television by, we were told, thousands of people. I said, if you thought the truth was hard, then reconciliation is going to be harder because it's now going to engage everybody in a dialogue that you may not want to have because the comfort of silence has been overwhelming over the years around the issue of residential schools. And the ability to hide behind that lack of knowledge, that ignorance, that unawareness, to coin a word, uh, is often being what gets us through our day, gets us through our ability to have a relationship with each other and perhaps even to have a relationship with ourselves. It has been that code of silence, in fact, that many survivors have relied upon through the years in order to be able simply to get by. The ability to forget, the attempt to forget, the opportunity to engage in activities, sometimes negative activities, that have been very difficult for them to get through and that have created their own problems. 
to try to wipe out that memory that they carry from residential schools has been the hallmark of many survivor stories. But that ability or that willingness, that desire to try to bury these things in the past always comes back and bites you. And we are seeing that today. We are seeing that because the pain of this is hard to suppress. And now it's being visited upon the lives of the survivors of the survivors, the children of residential school survivors and their children as well. The young people, such as the one who's trying to talk with me right now, <laughs> all have something about this that they want to know and they want to learn because they want to live in a good way in this world. And the first question they always need to have answered is, why are things the way they are? And so our obligation as a commission was try to explain that. More than 100 years ago now, in 1885, shortly before his execution, Louis Riel said, my people will fall asleep for 100 years, and it will be the artists and the musicians who will wake them so that they will be able to stand up, they will be able to take their rightful place in this, pla in this society, in this world. And borrowing from that line, I want to begin this morning by playing for you a video of a young musician who wrote a song over 20 years ago when he was a teenager, after he listened to some of the stories of survivors at our hearings during the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, he came to us, he came to me, he played me this song, and I thought, what a marvelous ability he has to convey a story in music like that. And so it sat for a long time until he was able, with the assistance of myself and others, to find a way to, to put this into video form. And so this song is by a young, I'll still call him young, although he probably would tell you he's not so young anymore. But this song is by a young Aboriginal musician by the name of Aaron Peters, who lives in Toronto now and uh, relies upon his musical ability to get by. And it's called A Perfect Crime. That was the title he gave it then. And it's a title that now he puts on this piece of music. It tells the story of residential school. It tells the story of his experience as well as a foster child in the child welfare system. And I think there is probably no work of art, work of music that tells it quite as directly and as explicitly as this one does. But I don't want you to be scared by it. I think it's a still a fine piece of music and a fine piece of art. I do also want to tell the survivors who are in the room and any of the children of survivors that there may be things that are said here that are going to cause you to be triggered, to be, uh, to be angered, to be Perhaps call yourself back to those things you don't want to remember. And for that I apologize, but I think this conversation is necessary for the rest of the room. So I understand if you feel at some point that you may need to leave, and I hope there are people here with you who can help you deal with whatever emotions this might cause you. So Kevin, if you're ready, we have a video called The Perfect Crime. I'd like you to watch it.
Kevin is queuing up a PowerPoint presentation. I just want to say that uh, we have discussions among the judges that I work with from time to time about what is a perfect crime. And often people simply define it as a crime you get away with. But actually, a perfect crime is whenever the victim believes that a crime has not occurred, nothing has been done wrong to them, and they actually defend the perpetrator. That's a perfect crime. And we see that constantly in this situation before us, where many people advocate that what went on in the schools was really not wrong. It was just perhaps a few people who did something bad. But as you will see, I hope, in the presentation I'm going to give to you, there's probably a lot about the schools over and above the abuse that we need to understand was wrong about the system. If we put the whole issue of abuse aside, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse, which you have heard a great deal about, I'm sure. You will, I hope, see by the end of this presentation that in fact the schools themselves were run in such a way that no one going to those schools as a student and living in that environment could possibly have come out of that schools in an undamaged state. And not only that, but what went on in the schools was perpetuated in the public school systems as well. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. Now, I have a device here that they tell me is guaranteed to work. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm at a disadvantage because I've got the PowerPoint behind me. So I have to look back from time to time just to see what is it I said about this particular point. But <clears throat> let me begin by saying that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has focused upon education throughout our work in telling the truth because we focused upon the schools. We've not only focused upon the residential schools, we've also focused upon the way public schools have educated people as well because that's an important part of our dialogue. Keep in mind that less than 40% of Indigenous people ever went to a residential school, more than 60%, and the numbers are even higher today because of the age of children, the number of children who go into public schools, have gone to a different system than a residential school. And so the question becomes, how could those schools have possibly been responsible for so much damage that has been attributed to them over the years? And that's a question that I will deal with. Because when looking at the whole educational experience of all Canadians in this country, we say that education is really what's gotten us to this point where the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people is so negative and is virtually inflamed through racism and, and marked by racism at many levels, some of it very unconscious racism, that in order for us to deal with it effectively, we have to look to education and educational systems to address it in a very thorough way going forward. So it's going to take us a long time. But education was very important to uh, Indigenous leaders back at the time of Confederation. We begin with Confederation because largely up until Confederation, Aboriginal people and the relationship they're having with non-Aboriginal people in this country, while challenged by uh, aspects of colonialism and settler populations and territoriality and things, was still largely uh, under the control. The lives of Indigenous people were still largely under their own control. They were still self-determining entities. They were still able to get by with their economies and their way of living and their cultural practices and their spirituality. It was being interfered with by the churches and by other entities, but for the most part, until Confederation, there were no laws that were taking away any of their rights. There were issues raised with respect to people taking over land that didn't belong to them and all of the things about that, but they could have and were being resolved in ways that didn't involve uh, unilateralism, 
as we came to see mark the experience in the future. But when Confederation occurred, Aboriginal leaders were well aware of the impact that uh, this new dominion of Canada was going to have, and its desire to expand into the West was an important element in the dominion's future. And so Aboriginal leaders in the West wanted to make sure that they were part of this dialogue. They wanted to be part of this expansion. And so they saw education as a means by which their children could be educated in the Western way while still being able to represent and help them in their indigenous societies to become full and functional partners of this new confederation. Because education was so important, they decided that they wanted to use the process that Canada was prepared to engage in, the treaty-making process following confederation, to ensure that education was addressed. The first treaties, if you look at the treaties, they really are land transfer agreements. They define land, they talk about giving up uh, title, giving up interest in land, so the treaties really were about land transfer agreements, surrendering claim to land, surrendering occupation of land, moving on to smaller pieces of land. So la the treaties in Western Canada after Confederation, after Canada became a nation, really were about taking Indians off the land and putting them into smaller parcels of land. But there's nothing in the treaties really concerning self-determination or self-government or uh, educating children or uh, dealing with taxation, things like that. The treaties are pretty silent and many uh, issues that are now very prominent in the dialogue between Aboriginal leaders and the government of this country. But when the treaties were negotiated, one of the first demands that the Indians put on the table was schools. They wanted schools built in their communities. They demanded that the government commit to educating their children. So they said, go back and rewrite your treaty to put in a promise that you will build a school on our reserve. And so this is an example of what we call a schools clause. This is in treaty number one, very first treaty that was negotiated after Confederation. Treaty number one contained this provision that the, Her Majesty would build a school whenever the Indians on the reserve would ask for it. And that, would, that was accompanied by promises that they would pay for the teachers, that they would ensure the children got educated in the communities. So there was a promise made in the treaties, and all of the treaties after Confederation contain a similar provision, a schools clause. That, their government, that the government would build schools on the reserve when the Indians demanded it. But the policy of the government was really different. Hiding behind these promises was really an intention never to carry out the treaties. There's a very famous quote that's in uh, Thomas King's book, The Inconvenient Indian, that I commend to your reading. Those of you who have not read it should pick it up. You know, make a lot of money for Tom. But <laughs> More importantly, it will educate you about things that you may never have known before. But in his book, he refers to a discussion from in the United States by an American general who was quite high up in the American administration who said, the purpose of the treaties really was to appease the Indians, just to get them to settle down and be quiet, because we knew as soon as we got their land and as soon as we got enough of them to sign treaties, we were going to ignore those treaties anyway. That was what the American policy was in the 19th century. And to a large extent, when you see the way the government treated these treaties, you can see that that probably was the thinking behind the treaty-making process in Canada in the 19th century as well. Because very few of the treaty promises that were given, other than we'll take your land from you, were really followed through on. And this was one of them. They needed to civilize the Indians, they said, because those Indians were inferior, they were savages, they were pagans, and they decided to do it through a process of Christianization. They, they had a number of studies that were done that they were relying upon. There was the Ryerson report from public schools in uh, Upper Canada that was done in the 1850s. Egerton Ryerson recommended there should be a public school system for all young people in, in Upper Canada, except for Indians, he said. Indians shouldn't be educated in the public school system because they are inferior people. They should instead be educated in industrial schools. They should be taught a peasant's labor, a peasant's 
skills so that they can do things that will support the greater industrial challenges that our children are going to be challenged to meet. So that was in his report. When I got my honorary degree from Ryerson University, I pointed that out to them. They were all, I want you to know, incidentally, all the students were quite pleased to hear that. Uh, I'm not too sure that the faculty was, but not the, <laughs> nonetheless, it's a story that's, that's commonly known. And in fact, the uh, Ryerson University went through a reconciliation process with their um, Aboriginal students as well as the Aboriginal community to acknowledge that. That was part of their history. And that's important, be able to put these things where they belong. And so, the man who comes from this place said this. And when uh, the Prime Minister of the country makes a statement like this, that, I mean, it just, just think about those words, right? When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents, who are savages. He is surrounded by savages, and he may learn to read and write. His, his habits and training and mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. I think that we should get t-shirts made. <laughs> For all Anishinaabe Aboriginal people saying, I'm a savage who can read and write. <laughs> <laughs> but this was, uh, this was the attitude. Now, Sir John A. MacDonald was a racist. People know that. It's the commonly known. Uh, he, was, he was far ahead of others in this field. There were many people in Parliament who followed his thinking, who were quite racist in their thinking as well. In fact, when you look at the debates in Parliament, in the 1880s and 1890s, not only about in, uh, Indian people, particularly after the rebellion in Saskatchewan in 1885, but also about Asian people, about people from India, about uh, people of, of um, color. Uh, the, the debates in the parliament are filled with racist statements, just filled with racist statements. It's embarrassing to Canada to, to see that, but they are there. So Canada was led by people who were racist. And Sir John A. was at the front of all of them. And this is what he said. But in addition to that, he said, we have to take those children away from their parents. We have to place them in these large industrial schools. He had commissioned a study by a fellow named Nicholas Davin, who had gone to Carlisle Indian Residential School in Pennsylvania and looked at that and said, yeah, that's the way to do it. We take all the Indians from their reservations, we put them in these boarding schools, and then we concentrate our activities on them so that they never want to go back to that pagan, heathen, savage life. There was a belief that they could be changed that way. And so Sir John A. said, lots of people are telling me to do that. Don't know how many, but that's the justification. And they were spending a significant amount of money in order to be able to build these schools, in order to be able to move the children to these schools. And so in order to justify it, this is the rationale that was used. This is the uh, symbol that the government used as part of its propaganda, uh, a picture of a young Indian boy by the name of Thomas Moore who was taken to the Regina Industrial School. On your left-hand side, you see he's dressed up to look like an Indian. We know it's a posed photograph, incidentally, because over here, Thomas is holding a little six gun, a little pistol. Not a lot of Indian boys were carrying little pistols around in their <laughs> little bag of toys, but it's a posed photo. We know it's a posed photo, because the intention was to show the savage Thomas Moore on one side and the educated and civilized savage on the other side. And so this is Thomas More, the representation of what residential schools were going to be all about. So they took a multi-generational approach to the whole problem. They decided that we're not going to be able to fix this in one or two generations. We're going to take our time. We're going to be dedicated to doing this. And it was 
uh, a commitment that they made over many years, despite the early failures, the early resistance, because not everybody wanted to be part of this process, but they knew that they were going to have to do it. Can I remove this microphone? Is somebody going to nod for me if I carry this microphone around so I can? Is it a wireless? All right, let's see what happens if I move over here so I don't have to keep turning my back to you. All right, are we good? That's better. All right, good. Oh, look at that, it's big. Okay, so they, they, they decided they were going to have to take the kids away from their parents. It was as simple as that. They knew that it wasn't going to work if we let children go back to their homes at night. And so they decided that taking them away and putting them in residential schools was the key. And involving Christian churches and missionary societies was also key because for a couple of reasons. One is they were dedicated to doing that kind of work. And secondly, they did it for free. This was part of their missionary commitment. This was part of their zeal to go out there and save souls. And so the government co-opted them into this idea. Maybe they got co-opted into the church ideal, but either way, they mutually co-opted each other into this process. And whenever the costs were raised, because it was expensive to build these schools at the time, they were building some huge residential buildings. This is the kind of response that they would get. Public Works Minister Hector Langevin, about whom buildings and streets are named, I think the Prime Minister is in the Langevin block, isn't he? Uh, in order to educate the children properly, we have to separate them from their families. Right? Some people say, no, this is hard, but we have to separate them. And so that's what they did. In the 1880s, though, they also saw the benefit because they had the American experience to draw upon. American Indians and the American government were at war with each other virtually since the 1860s. American Indian War, as it was called, it was waged at great expense to the American government. The Canadian government didn't want to have to go through that. So they said, if we have their kids in our schools, they're not going to go to war against us because we're holding the kids. And why would they fight us if we have their kids? Nowadays, we call that a human shield. Right? Like we put them in front of us and say that you can't harm us because you've got to go through your children first. Model of education, therefore, was not the model that was discussed during any of the treaty negotiations. Um, and they knew that when they were negotiating the treaties, even while they were talking in, about this in Parliament, they were still negotiating treaties with schools clauses in them. They were still promising the Indians that they would build schools in their reserves. But this was really what they were intending to do. They amended the Indian Act to make it mandatory for our kids to go to schools designated by the Superintendent General. You know who the first Superintendent General of Indian Affairs was? Sir John A. He gave that authority to himself because Western expansion was his baby. He needed Indians off the land. And this was part of that clearing the plains philosophy that he carried. And so, he was the first Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, and he held that office as well as being Prime Minister. So right from the beginning, children were talking about what was being done to them, because from the moment they arrived, their traditions and practices were prohibited. They were punished physically for trying to speak their language. That was recorded in, in, uh, in fact, directed by the missionary leaders that these children have to be stopped from practicing their culture, from speaking their language. They were demeaned from the beginning. They were told they were savages, they were pagans, heathens, they were inferior people, they were dirty. They're, they all talk about, every survivor talks about being scrubbed down the day that they arrived, having their clothes taken away and burned because they were told that there were bugs in their clothes, there were bugs in their hair, their heads were shaved, their hair was cut. Brothers and sisters were separated from each other, and they were prohibited from speaking with each other during the time that they were in school, because that would be a way of transmitting culture and love and content. And so parents had mixed feelings about this. Some of them thought, this is the only way we're going to get an education, so we have to put up with it. But others said, no, we have a promise in our treaties to build schools, and that's what we want. 
So in the schools, the reality was that their kids were being institutionalized virtually from the outset. They were separated from their family and from their community. Survivors always talk about the fact that they weren't allowed to see their families. They couldn't go home every uh, holiday, always. They couldn't go home, sometimes even in the summertime. They were kept separated from their parents. If the parents would come to visit them, they wouldn't be allowed to visit with their parents. So they were treated as though they were incarcerated. So the treatment in the schools was very demeaning. They were physically punished. They lived in fear constantly. Their language was denied. Their family relationships were denied to them. Their culture was denied, and European religious systems were imposed upon them. Death rates were very high as well. John Malloy, in his book, The National Crime, estimates that death rates were 24 to 42%. That's referred to in a report that was written in 1907 by Dr. Peter Bryce, who was a senior health officer for the Department of Indian Affairs, and he called his report The National Crime. He reports 24 to 42% of the children who went to residential schools died, either at the schools or shortly after leaving the schools. It's an amazing statistic when you look at it. That death rate, because of the schools, that's, that's, the, that's the element, so the essence of the report. Because of the schools, because of the way they were being treated in the schools, they were dying at enormous rates. For his uh, efforts, he was removed from office. So after about 1917, we don't see any reported death statistics in any of the records anymore. We have to search for them through provincial archives. So the kids in the schools were being subjected to physical abuse and injury through the discipline that was imposed upon them. Sexual abuse was an early experience that was recorded uh, in the schools from the outset. You know, when you have institutionalized uh, situations like this, uh, predators, sexual predators, just naturally migrate to systems like this. And there's a reference in one of the studies that Residential schools were like a candy store to the sexual predators. Bullying went on in schools as well. Student on student abuse has become the hallmark for men. Much of the later abuse that went on in the schools, just indicating that cycle of violence that's going on. That's why reconciliation is going to be very difficult to achieve because a lot of the abuse that went on in the latter part of the school's existence occurred between students. So older students abusing younger students physically or sexually, and that led to ongoing relationship problems uh, between them back in their home communities. Because sometimes there are people from different families in the same community. And so there's a lot of conflict going on in some of the communities over that. And emotional violence within the schools was rampant. We know that the education standards were very poor in the schools. There was no educational curriculum standards for most of the history of the schools until after the Second World War. There was no curriculum that the schools had to follow and that were enforced, even when they did recommend the curriculum. Those who taught in the schools were not required to be certified as teachers until after the Second World War. And uh, a lot of the schools, a lot of the history of the schools was hidden, of course, from, from Canada. So you can see that the government has listed 140 schools that they feel responsible for. There's probably another 1,300 schools out there that Aboriginal kids were sent to that are not in the settlement agreement that uh, gave rise to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Of those uh, other schools, though, the treatment was essentially the same. But of those 150,000 that went through these 140 schools, Education was really not what the schools were all about. The schools were really about indoctrination. Were really about separating children from their parents because the government saw their parents as being unfit. This was really a child welfare system that the government had established right from the beginning. And so the result was that when you put in children in a situation like this, you could see that they're going to suffer because of it. Food shortages were constant throughout the schools. A lot of children were literally starving to death while in the schools. Neglect and violence were common experiences within the schools. Punishments were frequent. They were severe. We know that lots of children ran away. They developed a word in the documents, children eloped. That was the word they used, they eloped. Sounds kind of romantic, right? Children ran away to get married. Elopement 
was a serious issue for many schools because children who ran away were not always found, not always tracked back to their community. And so there's many children who ran away from the schools about whom no one knows what happened. And we've heard stories from some communities uh, along lakes between schools and communities of finding bodies of children in rivers and lakes or in uh, isolated areas and just burying the children where they find them because they didn't know what else to do with them. Indian Affairs wouldn't come and collect the bodies when they were discovered. And the children who died at the schools were often buried in poorly marked graves or in unmarked graves. Uh, and some, are, some of the records we have found uh, there's an acknowledgement that sometimes two or three children will be buried in one grave at the same time because the death rates from disease were so high that they couldn't afford to dig one grave per child. So we know that sexual and physical abuse were rampant. Um, those who were prosecuted uh, were generally prosecuted for sexual abuse. People who were physically abused often didn't find that the government was interested in prosecuting for physical abuse. Um, and the question always arises in a crowd like this, people are thinking, well, why were the parents letting this happen? Why weren't they doing something about it? So let me deal with that. If they came and did this to your children, what would you do? You would resist it, you'd hide your children, you'd fight them, you'd make sure they never came and got your kids. Or you would protest, you know, you'd mark up, walk up and down the streets and make sure that there were signs and the media were paying attention. You'd challenge it in court, you'd challenge it through the political process, you'd vote those guys out of office. Or you'd go to war if you were an organized society, an organized nation. I already told you about the impact of going to war. They've got the kids. Going to war is not a viable option. So resistance was the first option I mentioned. And so resistance was rendered futile because they amended the Indian Act to make it um, punishable for a parent to refuse to send their child to a school. We found records of, ch of parents who were prosecuted and incarcerated, sent to jail for not sending their children to a residential school. So that was a power that was used frequently. And interestingly, every Indian agent under the Indian Act was appointed a magistrate and a prosecutor for purposes of any offense under the Indian Act. So Indian agent could literally come and in your own living room send you to jail. And we've heard of stories like that. Children are regularly rounded up in order to be taken away to the schools, often by police. The government paid what must have been enormous cost. We can't find the financial records for the cost that government paid for transportation because they don't exist anymore. In the 1920s, beginning of the 1920s, financial records <coughs> got burned every 15 or 20 years. And so these are among the records that government regularly destroyed, financial records related to residential schools. Some children were successfully hidden. <coughs> and uh, if, you're, if you did, weren't actually living on a reserve, then you didn't necessarily get caught up in the system. So if you moved off reserve into a local town, then you might be able to get away with it. Sometimes they'd track you down and bring your kid to the school anyway. But if you left the country, then they wouldn't chase you down if you crossed the border into the United States. So lots of families in south, southern British Columbia, in the southern mainland, would cross over into Washington and would go live there. Lots of families in the Maritimes would cross over into Maine or Massachusetts and go live over there. And we've heard lots of stories of people who left Canada in order to get away from this kind of experience. But the question arises is protesting now, because if they can't, if, if you can't uh, resist them, then maybe you can protest against what they were doing. So the government made that impossible too by amending the Indian Act. They made it illegal for people to gather in large numbers for any pretext. So the Sundance and Potlatch laws, which was really aimed at large gatherings of Aboriginal people, made it an offense to hold those ceremonies. So you couldn't gather together in order to protest. They, called, they passed an amendment to the Indian Act calling it the Indian Conspiracy Amendment. If three or more Indians gathered in a place to complain about the government of Canada, they were guilty of an Indian conspiracy. 
and therefore they could be prosecuted and they could be sent to jail. It's reviving itself, incidentally. <laughs> Bill C-51 has a similar provision. Indians could be prosecuted for wearing Indian garb. They never did define what Indian garb was, but certainly if you were wearing feathers and beads and buckskins, um, you're going to get prosecuted if you're an Indian. Now, interestingly, a non-Indian could wear Indian garb. Maybe that's where the Washington Redskins football team got the idea. But non-Indians could wear Indian garb, but not Indians. And movement was restricted. Indian pass system was created in the 1880s, which said that every person leaving an Indian reserve, every Indian person leaving a reserve had to have written permission from the Indian agent before you could leave, or you would be detained by the police. Now, they never amended the Indian Act or created a law to enforce this. They just made it a policy, administrative decision. And the police regularly stopped people, checking for the pass. If you didn't have it, they would detain you, put you in a cell, and ask the Indian agent, what do you want us to do with this person? And sometimes people would languish in jail for days before they'd be released back to their home community. So the Indian pass system became the model for the apartheid pass system in South Africa. We know from the records that people studied that from there. The right to go to court was restricted, so if you wanted to go to court and challenge these laws, you couldn't do that as an Indian because if you wanted to sue the government and you were an Indian person, you had to get permission from the minister first. <laughs> Don't know of anybody who ever got permission. So I used to wonder why are lawyers not, why were they not standing up and doing something about this? Well, it's because they also amended the Indian Act to make it illegal to obtain and, and give legal advice. Any lawyer who agreed to give legal advice was disbarred, subject to disbarment, if he gave legal advice to an Indian without permission from the government first. Now they argued, the government did, that this was in order to protect Indians from all these shyster lawyers. But the reality was it prevented Indians from getting any legal advice about their positions. And if they had non-Aboriginal friends who wanted to help them by getting lawyers to engage with them, because there were friends of the Indian societies that have sprung up in the 1880s and later, friends of the Indians, the Society of Friends of the Indians, they're all over Canada, we can see them. It became illegal for them as well to take action in court without getting permission from the government as well. So the ability to go to court was taken away. Political rights were taken away, so you couldn't vote them out of office. Indians lost the right to vote. Actually, people think that in 1960, Indians got the right to vote for the first time, but that's not true. In 1885, the voting laws of Canada allowed Indians to vote so long as they qualified under provincial voting laws. So you had to own property of a value of a certain amount. You had to be a man over the age of 21 and be able to speak or write in English or French. So as long as you qualify that way, if you were a status Indian, you could vote, and some did. But uh, the Mohawks ruined it for everybody because they went out and voted. <laughs> they tried to anyway. They were stopped because the government realized its mistake, and in 1891, through an amendment interestingly called the Indian Advancement Act, they took away the right of Indians to vote by saying, Persons can vote, and persons includes anybody other than an Indian. So nobody who was an Indian person was allowed to vote after that. Indian Act amendments uh, required that bands elect their leaders only through regulations imposed under the Act. Only men could be elected to office, only men could vote for them. So that undermined totally the role of women in positions of leadership. And we all know from local people what the role of women traditionally has been and was and now is coming back to be and should have been throughout. We wouldn't have had these problems if they were. Uh, and elected councils under the Indian Act were restricted in the powers that they, in the things that they could do. And we know that that became a serious issue as well. So in the uh, schools we see a lot of damage occurring and many, many times throughout the process that people were, were being harmed physically, but emotionally as well. Language was taken away, culture was taken away, their pride and sense of self-respect was taken away. 
Their ability to cope with problems was damaged. And there's a study that was done by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation on the mental health of uh, residential school survivors. And it talks about some of the psychological impacts of residential school experiences. And uh, the capacity to cope is one of the major major impacts of residential schools. Plus it also resulted in loss of respect for education, loss of respect for the community, loss of respect for the country. And, uh, and that continues to this day. And so when the government decided after the Second World War, because I think of a lot of things that were going on internationally, the international uh, community was now beginning to recognize the importance of conventions, Convention on Genocide was passed in 1949. International Declaration on Human Rights was passed after the Second World War. And recognizing that governments have to be held to a certain standard or they'll get away with things like occurred in Europe before the war. And so the government decided in 1950 or thereabouts, and we found the documents to support this, that they're gonna to start to close down the schools as their concern, I think the unwritten, the unspoken concern is they're concerned that they might be accused of breaching these international conventions. But by then the damage had already been done because we see the separation of families continuing into the 60s, 70s, and into today with the child welfare system, incarceration rates begin to go up, and uh, victimization rates begin to rise. 1962, Stony Mountain Penitentiary in Manitoba for the first time reports that Aboriginal men incarcerated in that penitentiary represent over 20% of the population. And that's causing them some concern because they only represented then about 2% of the population of Manitoba. And the report is, why is this happening? And we better do something about it now or it'll continue at this very high rate, they said. Well, now it's almost 70%. And the incarceration rates nationally are not much better. Child welfare rates are, are very high. About half of all kids in care in Canada are Aboriginal kids, and that's today. More children in care of government agencies today than were taken away to residential schools. Foster homes don't have to be culturally appropriate. So when we talk about residential schools taking away kids and placing them into a culturally uh, inappropriate environment or into an environment which denies them their culture, we need now to look at what the child welfare system is doing because they're doing the very same thing. As long as there is no obligation to create a culturally appropriate environment, child welfare agencies will do what they feel they have to do in the best interest of the child. So right now, the best interests of Indian children do not include a requirement to place them in a culturally appropriate environment because of a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada called Racine versus Woods from the 1980s. And so because there's no legal requirement, we often see that they're inappropriately placed. And foster and adoptive breakdowns are still exceptionally high for cross-cultural placements like that. In Manitoba, they have uh, almost half of the teenage children in care in Manitoba are being housed in hotels, not in family environments. So they're taking kids into care and they're putting them into hotels. How can they possibly justify that that's the best interest? How could it possibly be better than placing them with a family member and paying them to take care of the child? I don't know. Underfunding is a big issue with child welfare agencies. Uh, Cindy Blackstock's group taking this question to the Canadian Human Rights Commission and uh, I'm not speaking as a judge now, but I want you to know that I have no doubt in my mind she's going to win. And when that happens, then there's going to be appeal after appeal. But nonetheless, the principle will have been established. You cannot fund Aboriginal agencies at lower rates than you do the provincial agencies taking care of the same kid. If you transfer that kid from a provincial agency over to the Aboriginal agency, the federal government cuts the funding down 70%. The same kid. Same needs, same care, uh, it just goes to a different agency and the feds cut the funding down. Incarceration rates are still very high in Manitoba. These are the latest uh, data. 70% of all adult men incarcerated are, are Aboriginal. 80% of all youth are Aboriginal. 90% of all females are Aboriginal. And this is similar to Saskatchewan, Alberta as well. Northwest Territories are even a little bit higher. Uh, 
So you can see that uh, now when I talk about the second wave of separation, they can <laughs> shut down the residential schools, but they're still getting the opportunity to separate people from their communities and from their culture through these processes. So in Canada, we see that Aboriginal people constitute 25% of male admissions generally across the country. And in the same year, Aboriginal youth constituted 24% of imprisoned male youth, and 34% of all of the females incarcerated across Canada. 34%, one out of every three females incarcerated are Aboriginal females. So those numbers are going to continue unless something is done. And victimization, we know that Aboriginal women are victimized at astoundingly high rates. And uh, despite what the minister says, I don't believe it's always at the hands of Aboriginal men because the rates are just too high for those numbers to be that way. This, uh, this number here speaks about a lot of things, you know, but it primarily speaks about the disrespect that society has for Aboriginal women. And that disrespect is perpetuated in many ways, but this is the ultimate statement of it, that violent crimes and death for Aboriginal women are such astounding. And among Aboriginal youth, homicide and suicides are the most frequent causes of death than accidents. For non-Aboriginal youth, it's primarily accidents that they're dying of, but for Aboriginal youth, it's homicides and suicides. So, I have another video. If you could uh, line up video number two for me. Uh, down the PowerPoint at this point, because we're running into some time, right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to turn the PowerPoint down. I'm going to line up another video. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this video. Uh, because the question always comes up, now what do we do about all of this? This is part of what the legacy of residential schools is, and that's why things are the way they are. But now what do we do about it? Well, we need to embrace change. We need to embrace the need for change. And this is a message that has been going back uh, for decades. We said it in the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry report in 1991. Royal Commission on Aboriginal People said it in their report in 1996. Other reports that have been done at provincial levels throughout the country have been saying it. Things need to change. The way that society is treating Aboriginal people, talk about Aboriginal people, needs to change. All of that messaging that I talk about, the way that Aboriginal kids were treated in the schools, that they were told they were in fear, they were dirty, they were pagans, heathens, and savages, that very same message was given in the public schools of this country. I never went to residential school. My relatives did, many of my cousins did, my dad, my uncles, my aunts all went to residential school, my grandparents did. So they experienced that treatment, but I experienced that treatment too because I went to public school. I went to public school and I was educated in a system that didn't teach me anything about who I was as an Aboriginal person. Education is very important to all of us. And education is really designed to help us answer some very important questions in life. Plato says that there are five major questions society has to help us answer. Our elders say there are four. And the elders that I've spoken to tell me that those four questions are, where do I come from? Which is about our people as well. Where do my people come from? It's about our history, but it's also about our creation. What is our creation story? Where did this world come from? We need to know that. Society needs to educate us about that. It needs to educate us about that in a way that we are connected to. It's not about where do other people come from, and now I have to accept that. So the story that comes from the Bible is not our story, our elders say. We have our own creation story. And our young people today are standing up and saying, as they did in the I Don't Know More movement, we are not going to take that anymore. We want to know what our story is. Who are we? We want to know where do we come from so that we can say that we have that understanding 
of our creation. And society has an obligation to educate our children to be able to answer that question. And if you educate children and teach them that they come from a particular place or a particular process that has no connection whatsoever to their teachings and their understanding of life, then they're not going to connect to it. And they're not going to believe it. And they're not going to accept it. And they're not going to live with it. And they're going to look for those answers, which young Aboriginal people are doing today. I did it. And others are as well. The second question is, where am I going? What's my future? It's not just about what am I going to be when I grow up, or what am I going to do next week, or next month, or next year. It's also, what happens to me when I die? What is my teaching about the afterlife? What is my connection to the Creator, to God? Those are important questions. Those are important issues that we need to address for ourselves because that talks about faith and hope and a sense of obligation to ourselves and to others. It's what holds us to a certain standard. If you want to go back to be with God, if you want to go back and be with your ancestors, then you have to live a good life. That's what we tell our young people, right? That's why we say to them, you know, you got to live this day so that you can go back and be with your ancestors afterwards. I think that's why so many young Aboriginal people are committing suicide. I think it's because they hope to go and be with somebody who's already over there without understanding that there is a process by which you have to do, you have to follow to get there. So that question, where am I going, is a very important question. And we have to make sure that our people understand it because it's also about that is not your decision to make. It is a teaching about suicide. It's a teaching about homicide as well. That it is not for you to decide when to end this. That when it does end, that that's what will happen. And the third question is, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Why am I here? And we learn that in our culture, through our naming ceremony, through our connection to clan. We know what our clans are, we know what the teachings of our clan are, and therefore because we belong to that clan, we know what, what they are told and we are told their role is in the community, in the nation, and therefore that becomes our role, it becomes our responsibility as well. And in our naming ceremony, our naming ceremony, according to our teachings, is that when you were created, that the Creator sent a spirit to be part of your existence, to be part of you, and that spirit occupies you, that spirit is part of you. And when that spirit came to you, that spirit had a name. And that spirit has a name, and you now have to find out what that name is. So that's why we go to elders and we say, can you help me find my spirit name? Because elders who do it properly will know that they're not looking to make up a name for you. They're looking for the name that that spirit already had when they came to you. And when you learn the name of that spirit, that spirit comes with a story. That name has a story. So my name is Mizanagiji. That's my spirit, Mizanagiji. It literally means letters in the sky, or writings in the sky. But the story of it is about a young man who goes out from day to day as he's growing up, trying to understand things to help people, so that he can help people. So he goes out and he watches the sky for messages. And he begins to see messages in the sky. And so the story of my name is translated to me, the one who speaks of pictures in the sky. So that's my name. And so that means I have a role to play. That's why I'm here, to carry those messages back to the people. And I belong to the fish clan. And the water clan is the philosophers, the dreamers, the thinkers, the ones who are charged with helping people to arbitrate things by thinking things through, the resolvers of problems. So maybe that's why I'm a judge. I don't know. I just know that that's part of the role that I'm expected to play in our community. 
Now, mind you, my wife is an air clan. So you can imagine the nature of our relationship. <laughs> and she's always reminding me that really, fish only exist to feed the bear. <laughs> and, and so I've come to accept that that's part of my role as well. So, how many bear clan over here? See, look at this. I knew that. So this, uh, this video that I want you to watch, though, is about young people. Because each of the events that we held, each of our national events, we brought together young people, and we told them about this story, residential school. And we showed them pictures, and we talked, we, we had survivors talk to them, and they got a chance to talk to survivors. They had a chance to talk to other young indigenous people who were children of survivors and grandchildren of survivors. So they had a chance to talk to amongst themselves and to learn about this experience. And then we said to them, what do you think? What do you think? It's about a five minute video. I'd like you to listen to what they have to say because they're amazing. They're just amazing. We run the video, Kevin? The second one. Sound. It's about reconciliation. <clears throat> we know that among you are the future leaders of this country. Among you are those who are going to govern this land. Among you are those who are going to make important decisions about reconciliation. And you are going to have to come to terms with this history that you're going to hear a little bit about. And we know that's a difficult process, but it all starts with three things. You must watch, you must listen, and you must show respect. It's finally nice that we realize everything and we learn about it, what really happened. My grandparents, my mom, we've been through this residential stuff, so I just really wanted to know more about it. I've learned a lot, actually, considering that my grandma didn't tell me very much or anything. So I've learned what abuse they had to go through. I've learned when it started, how long it was for, when it ended. I've learned a lot. I want to learn about what happened to my dad when he was in residential school. And I want to learn the healing process and what will help with it. It makes me feel kind of sad, kind of, for those kids because they were kind of, it was torture, you know, it's not fair. They just, they took, like, they just took the away from their homes and they just, here yeah, go to that school. I, I just didn't agree with that. It's just really wrong. It makes me upset when I think about it because just knowing what, like, my dad and his mom had to go through, it's really hard and, to deal with, I guess. I don't know. It bothers me a lot. And now I realize like why my dad drank so much when I was a little kid, I guess. It'll kind of change the way I think about things, like how it would like affect someone's life and their kid's life for like generations. That's one of the worst things that Canada did. I hope events like this just are able to bring closure to a lot of horrible things that happened and I hope a lot of people now recognize that crime happened and that we need to make amends for it. I'll never forget this day because th today is the first day they ever told us about residential schools and if I ever see anyone that's Aboriginal, I'll ask them if they can speak their language because I think speaking their language is a pretty cool thing. I like being around this. I like hearing the drums and seeing everybody else and learning about new nations and all these new languages I have not heard of yet. I think we should start a dance crew and start bringing back our culture, start speaking our language, and everyone should just treat each other equal. Our traditions carried on and passed down so that all our younger generations and so that my baby knows 
what happened in the past to her ancestors and so that she can just keep bringing our tradition forward and passing it on to her kids and their kids and everything. And I hope that something like this never happens again anywhere in the world. And the importance of letting people know this so that it doesn't happen again. And it's good for the younger generation to know that so that we all treat each other as equal. Sinclair has 
kindly agreed to take a couple of questions. But he's got a flight um, uh, out of Ottawa, and uh, I know that many of you have classes. The buses will uh, be going back to campus uh, uh, in about 10 uh, minutes, 10, 15 minutes time. So if we can have one or two questions um, uh, that, uh, that Justice Steve might can answer. Yes, sir. I'm uh, one of 12, and um, my dad did six and a half years jail time for us not to go. And me and my brothers were still trying to uh, find out how we could get answers on that part because uh, the band cut us off because we said no to the church and the school. And uh, the record shows that he was in there for six and a half years. Where do we go? Uh, well, I don't know if you heard the question, but it has to do with his father who was incarcerated for not sending the children to schools. And where can you go with that uh, to get more information about that? And uh, uh, I'll say to you right now that it depends. And maybe the best way of us approaching this is speak to me afterwards and I'll get some more detail from you and see if we can find somebody that can get those answers for you. Okay? All right. Yes. I always tell people that if you, <clears throat> if you haven't figured that one out, then maybe you're not ready for it. <laughs> Fourth question is, who am I? Who am I? Because those first three questions all lead to that, right? Where do I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? And who am I? It also is about who are we, the same thing. Yes. Yep. Thank you for that question. It's about the role of the newcomer population, the immigrant population, that, uh, and what role do they play in all of this. Um, they, they play the exact same role that all of us do going forward, and that is that their obligation to reconciliation is the same as everybody else's. Their connection to the history of this is different, though, and we need to understand that. And uh, I, I've been asked that question by others who said uh, not only, and not because they're immigrants, but because they say to me, I didn't do any of that. My parents didn't do any of that. So why does this, why do I have an obligation to do anything? And my answer to them is the same as my answer is to the immigrant population, is that you may not be connected to that history. And I don't care if you're not connected to that history, but you are connected to the future. And my question is, what are you going to do about the future of this country now that you know this? because your obligation is to make this a better place as well. And so informing yourself about this is key to that. So understanding why things are the way they are and understanding that Aboriginal people are not living on the streets and are not the most impoverished people in this country because they're inferior, but because of what government and society has done to their nations and to their structures over the years, is important to having a proper conversation going forward. So. And uh, with the immigrant population, we also have an element of racism that comes from their own educational system back home because we have met people who've spoken to us and have told us that when they came here, they thought that Indians were going to be living in teepees and living in the bush and still hunting, fishing, and trapping. And they're surprised to see them living in cities. And so part of it is their own educational system that they're coming from. They need to understand what that has misinformed them about as well. And so. There's a lot of work to be done by everybody, but the immigrant population has some work to do too. And they, they have a connection to this in, the, in terms of what that future holds. It's a challenge for all of us to have to come to terms with that history. But I remember a story about uh, when I was doing a, a conference in uh, Vancouver, we had a victim of the Rwandan genocide come and speak to us about his experience in reconciliation. And he talked about living in a community of um, uh, a village in which the people in his neighborhood uh, on the day that the genocide started descended on his family and killed every member of his family and almost killed him. He was just a little boy. And they left him for dead in the house and they, all of his parents, all of his family died. His brothers, his sisters, his mother's father, his grandparents were all murdered 
in the beginning of the genocide. And, and yet, he said, when he grew up, he became the director of the reconciliation project for the Rwandan government. And he said, in order to get on with his work, he felt he had to go back to those people who had killed his family and forgive them. Otherwise, he was constantly carrying that pain around. And so he said he went and did that. He went to them, each and every one of them that he remembered were in the, the home doing that, and told them that he understood why they felt compelled to do that, because they were under orders as well. They were under, in fact, uh, they were coerced into doing that. Uh, but he told them that he forgave them for what they did. And I said to him, I find that hard to believe. It's such an amazing act of kindness to go and tell them that you forgive them. It must have been hard, he says. It was, and, and he says, the reality is though that each and every morning that I wake up, I have to forgive them again. And that's his commitment to reconciliation. <laughs>